his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Back in the day when I was a graduate acting student studying classical theater, my teachers were fond of saying, there is no subtext in Shakespeare. For a performer, the word subtext refers to a particular technique, often called method acting, in which actors build character from the inside out, using nonverbal cues underneath the written dialogue. Stanislavski, the Russian theater guru and father of method acting, defined subtext as the manifest, the inwardly felt expression of a human being in a part which flows uninterruptedly beneath the words of the text, giving them life and a basis for existing. In other words, subtext gives actors motivation for what their characters say and do and may indicate that while a character may say one thing, something very different may be happening in her heart. Audiences infer what's really going on through the actor's body language and other unspoken behaviors. So when my acting teachers confidently declared there's no subtext in Shakespeare, they meant that in contrast to method acting and modern drama with Shakespeare, everything happens in the text or on the line, as actors say. The words are what you have to work with. Feelings and mood and action are created entirely from the words themselves. In essence, they were saying, trust the text. The text will give you everything you need. I appreciate my teacher's efforts to preserve the purity and genius of the greatest dramatist in human history and protect it from a bunch of youthful overacting. But the truth is that words alone are rarely enough to tell the whole story, especially when the language recited is from another age and unfamiliar to our ears. The audience or the congregation needs more such words must be performed, brought to life if they are effectively to make meaning and expose truth. And so we bring our own experience and scholarship, our imagination and emotion to inflect and interpret them. Otherwise, we may find ourselves worshiping the text rather than God. Sacred words risk becoming relics in a museum instead of living, breathing agents of change. Now, this is not a sermon about acting Shakespeare. It's not even about the hazards of biblical idolatry or literalism, but rather about how we tell our story so the story can reveal its truth. It's about bringing words like the ones we just heard to life. And I find this appro approach particularly appropriate for the Gospel of John, which begins with the word becoming life, becoming flesh. Jesus is the word that was with God and was God, the word that lived a human life. And John the Evangelist chooses certain words to tell Jesus' story, words that are then written down so that Jesus might be brought to life not only for John's community, but for every future community, including ours. So we have these words about the word. And the question becomes, what more do we need for this word to be made alive for us? Today's story of Jesus turning water into wine is a familiar miracle story, even for people who never go to church and who've never read the Bible. There's plenty of historical and theological research that may enhance our comprehension of these words from John's gospel, but 
I'd like to spend a few minutes considering what makes them come alive, and specifically one intense moment between Jesus and his mother. Now, it's a lean narration. There's a wedding taking place in Cana of Galilee. It's three days after John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and publicly named him the Son of God, claiming that he saw the Holy Spirit descending from heaven to rest upon him. Jesus, his mother, and his disciples are among the wedding guests. The action of our story begins when the hosts of the wedding run out of wine. Jesus' mother says to her son, they have no wine. His words in reply are, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. Jesus' mother then speaks to the servants, saying, do whatever he tells you. The text then describes six huge empty water jars nearby and Jesus' instructions to fill them with water, draw some off, and take it to the chief steward who tastes not just wine, but mwah, excellent wine. And the lesson concludes by noting that this is Jesus' first sign performed in Cana of Galilee to reveal his glory and that his disciples believed in him. So John, in his gospel, doesn't call this a miracle, but a sign, the very first sign meant to reveal Jesus' identity and God's purpose. The miracle of water becoming wine is as astonishing to the people of Jesus' day as I imagine it would be for us, but the story as sign makes it come alive and brings us to that subtext moment. Because something happens between Jesus and his mother, something not in the text, that sets the whole of John's gospel in motion. Jesus' mother appears only twice in all of John's gospel, here at the wedding of Cana, and again at the foot of the cross. She's never named, she speaks only once, in this scene, nevertheless, her presence, framing Jesus' ministry and bookending his life, invites us to use our imaginations to consider the depths of their relationship in this moment before the miracle. For it is Jesus' mother who interprets the sign before the sign. Right? She recognizes this running out of wine at a wedding as more than just misfortune for the party goers and embarrassment for the bridegroom. It is the long-awaited and pivotal moment in Jesus' destiny. So she opens her lips and speaks these words to Jesus. They have no wine. And Jesus pushes back. What concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. And what follows is a wordless exchange between mother and son a subtext pregnant with their shared knowledge of the mystery of Jesus' incarnation. So all around them swirls a party, one that's about to get even better, and this mother turns away from her beloved son, instructing the servants, do whatever he tells you, and there is no going back. Jesus' mother knows before he does that his hour has come. And the poignancy of her knowledge communicates something beyond words. Love and loss are fully present, and she steps forward anyway into the promise her son offers the whole world. So Jesus performs this first sign act of John's gospel, transforming ridiculously large quantities of water into the finest, the most mouth-watering wine to signal God's glory. And underneath words about the coming of Jesus' hour is the subtext, the whole extraordinary truth of his incarnation, which includes death, because that which is incarnate will one day die, and also, and more importantly, conveys the promise of something beyond, a richer, more abundant life than humans can possibly imagine, intimate knowledge of God, unending, exquisite joy for all, and a party that lasts forever. It is all there in just a few words and a sip of wine. 
and it can be easy to miss. From just underneath these things, it's possible to hear and taste what they make manifest, the inward and spiritual grace of God flowing forth from those words on a page, giving them life and a basis for existing. Subtext, then, is a way to understand sacrament as the timeless is made tangible. And we sacramental Christians don't have to look far this morning for a vivid illustration. In today's text, the mother of Jesus says to her son, they have no wine. She could say the same thing about us. The last time we heard this passage from John's Gospel in church was in 2019, before a global pandemic prompted our bishops to suspend sharing of the common cup during communion. And nearly two years later, the guests still have no wine. And while our sacramental theology assures us of the efficacy of Holy Communion in one kind only, for many, the experience of Eucharist is less spiritually sustaining than it was before. Maybe not for all, but for many. And the question, when will we return to receiving what we've been promised, the body and blood, the bread and the cup, that hangs in the air every Sunday. We bring this subtext with us, and it can't help but alter our experience of word and sacrament, as it should. We say the same words, and they convey new truths. Now, I trust that the church will not continue its policy of restricted access to the cup forever, but it's fair to acknowledge our loss. More than fair, it's faithful to bring our inward attention to the living word and let it move and affect us. We have a very long season of epiphany ahead in which to look and listen for the story underneath the story, to meet this turn in the church calendar in the midst of the world's uncertainty and suffering, open to the present power of subtext and sacrament to convey the gospel anew. It is here, in this season of revelation, that we discover the living word once more and experience glory in ways we never thought possible. It is now that Christ, the Son of God, shall be manifest in us, that our lives may be a light to the world.